What exactly is an op-ed? Um, I start very basic, as I said. Um, so any thoughts out there? I've included a headline here, a couple of um, just uh, leads and headlines uh, from the New York Times and Seattle Times of science-related op-eds. Um, it's very basic. An op-ed is an opinion expressed in essay form. So even the word op-ed, does anyone know what that, that means? Its first um, original meaning was opposite editorial, because the place in the newspaper where the op-ed was placed was opposite the editorial page. So the editorial being the voice of the paper, who the paper might be endorsing as a political candidate, what the paper has decided to say about X number of topics, or, or X or Y topic. Um, and opposite that would be um, people who weighed in from outside, so not staff members of the particular newspaper or the news organizations, but people who came from the community who would weigh in on a topic of public relevance or of current salience. Um, so um, I think that's important too, just to note, because this is a place in a, a newspaper, and now of course, now we think of a newspaper, it's a very different thing, right? We have um, online formats for op-eds, we have purely digital, digital um, formats for um, for op-eds that never appear in paper, but they still sort of embrace this philosophy, which is that we want outside voices to be contributing to uh, the publication and to what the publication is contributing to its readers. Um, so, so you, as um, people who might not end up in news organizations, can contribute op-eds and pitch them to uh, news publications without being on the staff of them. Um, Another point you picked up on was that it's often trying to change. An op-ed is often trying to change the state of affairs. So I would say that some, some op-eds offer sort of specific policy prescriptions. Here's what we should be doing um, legislatively. Here's what we should be doing as a community. Um, here's a law that ought to be changed. Um, but others, um, others are just sort of persuasive in terms of trying to change public sentiment about the issues. So if you read The End of Snow, uh, the Porter Fox op-ed, which was really about um, a lament for the disappearance of snow, it didn't quite necessarily offer um, a specific opinion about specific policies that needed to change, but it was persuasive in nature. It was trying to persuade you of a point of view, that there's a problem here. Um, the other thing I would emphasize that I think is important about op-eds is that they often react to or reflect on current events. So um, in all three of the op-eds I shared with you, there was a sort of um, what we would call in the news industry, and you might have heard about in the, pre in the press release session today, a sort of news peg or hook, right, to kind of bring you into um, the topic through something that's already in sort of the public eye. So in the case of the end of snow, it was um, the, the particular um, peg of the Sochi Olympics, the Winter Olympics, and it, he began that op-ed by uncovering that all of that snow had had to been insulated right over the course of 16 months or something to protect that snow. Some of it had to be manufactured. Um, in the case of um, Michael Crichton's op-ed about patent law and a particular patent case that came before the Supreme Court, he was basically talking about the case that was going to be heard that week. And in the op-ed I shared with you that I wrote, it was um, very much a live topic that um, the head of the, the World Health Organization had just put out this announcement saying, um, basically, the doctors were left empty-handed. So I was reacting to that quote in the news. Okay, so another question I like to pose, again, starting very basic here, um, is sort of why a scientist would want to write an op-ed. Um, and um, these two pictures uh, are sort of not random. The, the picture on the left is um, Raphael Reif, who's the president of MIT, and he frequently writes op-eds, and they appear in the Washington Post. A recent one appeared in the Boston Globe. Um, he will write about the importance of science and technology research. Um, sometimes he writes about the importance of material science or physics research in particular, um, and sort of about innovation in the U.S. and what the threats to the innovation might be. On the right is a former student of mine. She took a class that I used to teach at Harvard's Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. She was a PhD candidate in chemical biology, and her name is Erin May. And she, um, her, um, op-ed that she wrote in the class ended up being published by the Toronto Star. And she decided to write an op-ed um, because she was really angered by this case that Novartis, the pharmaceutical company, was bringing in India in which they were trying to basically get an extended patent life um, based on a reformulation of a drug. So it wasn't an actually a new drug, it was a leukemia drug that they were reformulating and they were hoping to extend the patent life by a long time. And she wasn't writing it, for, by writing for the Toronto Star, she wasn't exactly going to change the law in India directly, right? So it wasn't necessarily specifically a legislative agenda, but she aimed to persuade people that this was a problem, right? And that this is something that we should be concerned about. I'll just add a few other sort of um, 
reasons. Um, so conveying an important point of view that has been overlooked. So and often in public debates, um, we find that people um, either misunderstand science or that there's confusion or controversy about science. Um, climate change, a field that I've worked in, has uh, we've seen a lot of that. Um, but there's been other instances. So um, in recent years, we've seen a lot of um, folks uh, from scientific agencies, the federal agencies, being asked to, set, to, um, to report what the relevance is of a study on fruit flies, for example, or a study that seems to not have any practical application in the real world. And scientists know something about the relevance of a study on fruit flies, right, to the broader problems we face as humans and as we face as a civilization. Um, so often, as a scientist, I feel, um, uh, or as scientists, uh, scientists will feel like they want to weigh in on these public issues because there's a need to sort of convey a point of view that comes from science. Um, providing a scientific perspective on current debates is a sort of flavor of that. Um, so. Uh, uh, sometimes there's a confusion about um, the rate of change that's happening, and a scientist wants to weigh in um, to say, no, the real rate of ocean acidification is much different than what we thought it was, or um, the studies that show that there was a link between autism and vaccines, those were incorrect, so there's a sort of clarifying role. Uh, and often the scientists who write op-eds um, are trying to persuade dis decision makers of a course of action. And sometimes it's as simple as funding for research. So um, how do we get, the, the example I give here is you know, the Large Hadron Collider. So when scientists are trying to convince uh, Congress people to make appropriations for our part of a project, of, of a large scientific project, for example, you'll see them writing op-eds to sort of talk about the role that science has played and inspiring a generation of young people, um, they'll talk about its importance in applications in industry. Um, maybe they'll talk about how the semiconductor came out of, originally came out of more basic um, physical science, or they'll talk about um, how insights from green fluorescent jellyfish led to um, the better ability to transplant organs, which this is all true, by the way. But um, so, um, and also um, issues where um, they're worried about the fate of how um, policy is affecting science. So the example I give there is intelligent design being taught in schools as if it's commensurate with evolutionary theory. You see scientists weighing in on this issue, um, at least especially when it was still a hot legislative or a hot legal issue. Um, scientists would get involved in the public debate and writing op-eds. And um, one of those headlines that I showed you um, from a previous slide was a scientist who was weighing in on this current debate, which is really about STEM education and whether we're doing enough to educate young people in, in the sciences. You see a lot of scientists writing about that topic because they're concerned about public education. And they want to see decision makers do something different, like change the policy, change the edu education system. I also think there are other sort of more maybe selfish motives. Um, and I don't say that necessarily in a bad way, but um, op-eds can be great to establish yourself um, as an expert on a topic or a public intellectual on a topic. And you'll see um, scientists weighing in on topics for that reason. Also to promote a forthcoming publication, um, but with the caveat that it is very different than a news release. So you raised that great point um, earlier that it's not about necessarily about the narrow finding. It's not a news flash about a finding. It's an opinion about a broader issue. But um, if you have a forthcoming publication that's really relevant to a broader issue, an op-ed can be a good way to sort of tie that together. And we can get more into that. So this is um, a woman named Katie Orenstein who founded um, a nonprofit called the, the Op-Ed Project. And this is her reason um, that people should write op-eds in general, not just scientists, but scientists are people too. Um, and she says, because the stories we tell determine what we think about what happens, which determines what happens next. Um, which sounds a little bit cryptic, but if you think about it, I thought it was a very poignant way of saying um, why we want to engage, right? Why do we want to tell stories to the public? Why do we want to share opinions with the public? Um, it's because it helps determine our future and, and what priorities we set in the future. I wanted to sort of um, put forth uh, some of what I think are um, the elements of effective op-eds. Some of my favorite um, op-eds, the best op-eds that I've read. I shared with you two op-eds that I think are very effective, and then I was looking for an op-ed that I thought was less effective and decided to, decided to share my own because I, I decided not to throw anyone under the bus other than myself. So, um, so I'll just say a little bit, um, and I wrote that op-ed, I will say, um, that you read about the Ebola outbreak um, in a very, very quick turnaround, and we'll get to why I did that. Um, but um, I, t I sort of think that the, the, op -ed, the other op-eds I shared with you are stronger op-eds, and I'll, and I'll say a little bit about why as we go on. So the attributes of effective op-eds in my perspective are that they make a convincing and concise argument. 
So after you read it, you can say in basically five seconds what the argument was, and you feel somewhat convinced by it. Even if you disagree with it, you feel persuaded. Timeliness and relevance. I can't emphasize this enough. So um, when a reader is scanning through a newspaper, or scanning headlines online, they have many choices of things they can read. So the question is, how is this relevant to the reader's life? Um, how is this important? Um, and why is it important for them to read now? Why is it more important than the 10 articles about Trump or whatever else they might be reading? Um, strong evidence and logic, I think, is critical. Um, so uh, reasoning, sharing your reasoning, uh, and sharing some of the evidence that brings you to your conclusions with the readers. So scientists tend not to have too much trouble with this third bullet point, mm -hmm. uh, because, of course, in scientific papers, you outline your methods, and you outline your conclusions, and you have a dis discussion of session. And, and the evidence and the logic are sort of um, put to the forefront in that process, right? So it's really about engineering that same process of providing your, your evidence and, your, and the logic that brought you to your conclusions, but doing it in a way that's um, easier for non-scientists to relate to, of course. Captures interest and attention. Um, so uh, you might disagree that the two, the two op-eds I'm referring to that I, I shared with you were, were strong, but I think that they both use techniques of, of capturing interest and attention um, that were pretty compelling. So the last criteria I put in um, that I think the effective op-eds do is that they engage with the audience's values. So capturing interest and attention, um, having it be timely and relevant, are about engaging your audience, like right from like the point of view of you want the audience's attention. The audience is distracted and has competing um, demands on their attention, but. Speaking to the audience's values, I think, is a little bit different. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about the concept of frames as we get into the steps of writing an op-ed. But I just want to like, kind of hold that attribute, because I think it's not one that's often mentioned when we talk about writing op-eds. But because the goal of an op-ed is to persuade, um, you're going to hit up against people's values. right? And if those values, if you are coming to them and they have a certain set of values, um, for example, if they're very, very concerned about protecting their children, and that's a value that they hold very dear, coming at them with um, a slew of data that shows that there's no link between vaccine and autism, as true as that might be, might not speak to their values, right? It might speak to their values more if you tell them that you share their values and that you're concerned about the immunity of the larger set of children as a whole and that that will protect their children as well. Um, so I'm just sort of want to put that flag in the sand, and, and again, we're going to keep, we're going to move forward here and get deeper into the, all of these issues and attributes. So I want to really um, set you up so that you will feel um, like when an issue is burning for you and you have a strong opinion and you want to weigh in with an op-ed, that after this workshop you'll feel like you have the tools to get yourself from that opinion to mm -hmm. writing an op-ed. And um, so the first step in that um, is really, well, it's really five steps, is, is really thinking through how you turn that opinion into an op-ed. Because for me, at least, as someone who writes a lot and writes for a living, um, I find that my writer's block, I only face writer's block uh, when I haven't uh, figured out what I'm exactly saying. So it's usually a block of thinking and a sort of crisis of thinking. Um, and I think going through these steps can really be helpful to sort of when you get to the point where you're writing, you can be focused on the writing and the words you need to say to make the science clear and all the other tools that you've been learning today about science communication. So the first step is to ask what kind of issue is this? So um, we're going to work with some of your ideas for op-eds at some point here. but. Um, so if you have an opinion that you're trying to put into the public realm, I think it's important to think about whether the issue is something that's already on the public's mind, already important to people and urgent, or something that's sort of on the back burner. So the metaphor I like to use is trains. So um, is the issue a train that has not left the station? Or is the issue a train that has already left the station? So what do I mean by that? And why am I even using this metaphor? So the train that has not left the station is uh, an issue where you really, it's not salient and urgent, it's not top of mind, top of priority for the public and for the audience that you're trying to reach. And uh, you need to overcome some significant inertia. You need to generate a head of steam. You need to generate urgency and a sense of relevance and salience. You need to focus on that in order to get that train moving, in order to get people to notice this issue. 
So in the case of the end of snow, um, while the Olympics were very much on people's radar, and he used that as a news peg, the issue of disappearing snow was probably not the first thing that the people who woke up that morning and opened the New York Times Sunday Review were thinking about. So he used a lot of techniques, I think, that followed on to the fact that that issue was a train that has not left the station. You could say that we're a lot more concerned about climate change than we have been, and so I think the train's starting to move, right, um, as, a, as a public. Um, but by and large, um, I don't think it's, it's what the readers um, were worried about that day. Um, a train that has already left the station is an issue where there's a lot of noise already, right? So the train's moving, the issue's moving, there's a lot of opinions, a lot of people weighing in on it, and it's really hard to hear amid the cacophony of noise and to understand what you should be paying attention to, what's the right perspective, there's a lot of confusing information. So the time I wrote this uh, Ebola op-ed that I shared with you was a time like this, right? There's a lot of panic in the country about Ebola, a lot of opinions, a lot of op-ed articles, a lot of articles, a lot of news reports about people coming into the country. Should we close the borders? How should we screen? When will there be a cure? Are the cures working? Um, and uh, I tried, I attempted in that op-ed to try to take a step back and offer some perspective and say, look, this is not just about the current crisis. This is actually a trend. This is a pattern of behavior. Let's look at how we deal with outbreaks as a whole and use this as an opportunity to do that. But I was trying to be heard among a lot of other noise. And so I, the techniques you use in that kind of situation are different. So that's the first question. The second question is, who is my audience? So who am I trying to persuade with my op-ed uh, to do what or to think what? Um, and I use this image of a whale with baleen because, for one thing, I love whales. Um, we are in the ocean state. And uh, for another thing, um, I think that we are kind of all like whales in the sense of baleen whales anyway, in that we are kind of filter feeders. So we take in information through a screen, and that sort of goes back to this issue of values that I was talking about. So we, when we read about something, um, we're not just getting the information as objective and as an, an unbiased as we think we are. Um, scientists and journalists, I will say, train themselves a little bit more for ob objectivity. Um, so they try to, I think, ch put checks and balances on um, the, you know, the good ones that try to put checks and balances on their subjectivity and their biases and the way they take in information. But by and large, as a whole, humans um, are filtering through the things that we've already experienced, um, the beliefs we already have, the assumptions we already have when we receive information. And it's an important thing to think about what, what that baleen might look like for uh, the people that you're trying to reach. So what kind of values and assumptions might they have? What kind of experiences? What have they seen that might scare them? So, um, right now, there's a lot of uh, news about the Zika virus, for example, and uh, people's experiences of the Zika virus are flavored by their experiences with other diseases like Ebola, right, or by, by their panic about other experiences that they've had in their lives, and different people are going to receive that different ways. And it's worth just taking a step to think through who your audience is and what those values might be. So there's a more technical way of talking about the baleen. Um, and um, there's an article from Science from 2007, I believe, and it was written by a researcher named Matt Nisbet and a science journalist named Chris Mooney. And um, they talked about the concept of framing science. And so they take this concept that comes from linguistics, which is frames, and they apply it to the concept of communicating science. And I still rely on this paper because I think it's a really interesting way of thinking about how we communicate science. So they make an argument in the paper that as a result of these different values and assumptions and beliefs that we all have, that scientists will be much more effective at communicating science if they take on frames, um, and I j just would say they think about the value of their audience, right? They, they use the paradigm of the of value shared with their audience um, and use that as a way of communicating. So the example they give in the paper, one of the examples they give is to say, um, when scientists are communicating about climate change with um, people who are religious, they should frame it in terms of religious morality. And they should say, you know, climate change is really about protecting and stewarding what we've been given on this earth. Or um, if they are talking about it with military folks, they should talk about, or people who are very sort of um, pro-defense, uh, national defense, they should talk about it in terms of national security and say, look, the Arctic is going to melt, and um, this is a national security issue. And since the time they wrote that, of course, a lot of that framing has been put into place in how people talk about climate change. Um, but at the time, and especially, um, I think there was a lot of talk uh, 
um, mainly about sort of iconic species like polar bears who are being lost to climate change, or talking about it from the perspective of the degrees um, of average temperature, two degrees Celsius, we can't get above that in average temperature, or parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And those are not just technical and hard to relate to, but they also don't necessarily identify with any particular value of an audience, right? So there's a little bit that sort of bleeds or is a gray area with sort of advertising that makes people a little bit uncomfortable about the concept of frames. Um, but I would say that um, you can see it at play even with people who aren't necessarily going to do anything that's um, a false pretense or, or try to sell anyone anything. So even in the op-eds we read, um, I would say that there's um, a fr fair amount of framing going on. Um, so if you think of a frame as uh, trying to appeal to a value of an audience person, um, and you look at the Michael Crichton piece, um, so s somebody, you brought up how frustrated you were and how uncomfortable it made you in, um, in terms of what our, where our society is going. And I think that Michael Crichton, in trying to raise this issue about the patenting of a very particular um, uh, relationship, um, uh, medical phenomenon, um, use the frame of sort of, we all share a value of freedom of expression, and we want to be able to express ourselves freely. We don't want thought control. So let me use that frame to make this piece about something broader while also about the narrow thing, the opinion that I have, right? So he's invoking those values. Uh, in the end of snow, I think there's a shared value around recreation and enjoying the beautiful natural places that we've experienced, and that is being invoked in that piece. So um, I would sort of say, as you think about your op-ed, think about what frame you should use. Maybe there's multiple frames, what values you want to appeal to, and how you frame that op-ed to convince your art audience. The next step, step four, is what is evidence and examples. And I love Spock, and um, I think it's important to bring him in here, because of course Spock was half Vulcan and half human. And um, of course his Vulcan side was sort of a uh, uh, broad brush uh, for his rationality and his logic, right? And his uh, human side was supposed to be his emotional and sometimes irrational side. And he brought those two together. And um, I say this because I think um, the evidence and examples should be drawing on, right? Like both the Vulcan and the human, both the pathos and the logos. So um, someone brought up um, the personal narrative and how they felt that that was effective in Porter Fox's piece. Um, I think that there's emotional, there are emotional appeals in op-eds that can be um, less obvious than that, that can be more subtle. Um, but evidence and examples um, that only rely on the rational, um, I think, um, can sort of miss a whole set of persuasive tools that can be used to get people to be on your side, right? So when I can picture the slopes going brown and the vistas disappearing and feel for this guy who's losing this thing that he's been passionate about his life, his whole life, I have a different emotional reaction than I have when I just read the information about the loss of snowpack. And both of those sets of information together become very convincing and compelling. I'm not sure I'd be convinced just by a story that I need to change anything or that I should be concerned about it, but the, the pairing of um, both the logic and, and the evidence um, that comes from different kinds of sources I think is um, a very effective way to think about going forward. So you kind of line all this up. This is sort of just like what you're lining up before you're going to write. Step five, which is the last step, is to think about what the counter arguments are. And here um, we were talking a little bit about how the public narrative, uh, is it Noreem? Yes. Um, so we were talking a little bit about how the public narrative kind of gets carried away and op-eds are an opportunity for scientists to engage and sort of correct the course of that public narrative. And I love this cartoon uh, because it's so true. Um, and <laughs> it's sort of, it's very hard, right, to, um, to get um, a narrative uh, to dominate public conversation, media conversation, especially in this environment we have, when you're, you're conveying complexity, right? And um, other people might be um, conveying something that's scientifically inaccurate, but it's simple and it, and it appeals to our heuristics, sort of like our simple shortcuts that we can use to understand the world around us, right? We're reinforced by what we've already witnessed and what we've already seen, and so people can appeal to that. Um, so this is all um, just the reason I put up this cartoon when I talk about anticipating counterarguments is because I think it's important to think about not just what are the logical attacks that can be made against my op-ed, like what are the good points that someone might make about my op-ed, but what are the sort of maybe simplistic and bad points that can be made to counteract my op-ed, but that will just appeal to people because people were go are going to feel like that's right, right? They're going to be scared. About, about people who have Ebola in their community, right? They're gonna be scared, so they're gonna think we should sh close the borders. 
Um, so you want to be anticipating counter arguments that are not just the arguments um, that other people, uh, your peers in, this, in the scientific community would have um, against your op-ed. And when you can kind of, as usually for me this is a process, like when I'm listing counter arguments, I'm also kind of starting to think about how I might preempt them in the op-ed, how I might sort of start to address them. And you can't address everything. And the good thing about our media environment is that you can also, after you write an op-ed, right, you can engage through social media and other ways to clarify points of view if people raise questions or people raise issues. And that's become a big part of, um, of being an op-ed columnist these days. So op-ed components, enticing lead or hook. I know you were talking about leads um, in the previous session. So really, this is just about how you open and how you hook people's interests. A clearly stated argument, we talked about that already. Um, support for that argument, those are where your evidence and examples come in. Uh, preemption of naysayers or counter arguments. Um, and then a sort of concluding kicker, um, uh, something that sort of leaves people with a sort of, I, th I think the word kicker is actually perfect because it's sort of like this Kick, it kicks you, in, kicks you in the gut with the issue, right? Like makes the issue kind of brings it home. And aim for 750 words, which is not a hard and fast rule. Sometimes they're very long. The end of snow is very long. Sometimes they're very short, like 500 words. Um, but 750 is going to give you the greatest likelihood of getting published. Um, some bonus tips. Be sure you can succinctly state your argument verbally before you begin to write. Tell the audience why they should care about this issue now. Express one sharp opinion rather than many. Establish your expertise and authority on the subject. Make use of rhetorical tools. And you learned about those this morning, so I will not get into that. OK, so how do you make a pitch once you have an op-ed? Um, to make a pitch to an editor. Um, the format is one paragraph or two paragraphs maximum to describe right, your op-ed. And then you want to paste your op-ed in the email below that. Um, Editors don't really open attachments. It's, they're in a hurry. I can't explain it. Um, <laughs> it's answer three, these three questions in the pitch, in this one, one or two paragraphs. Why is this opinion timely for readers right now? Why do people need to read it? Why is it, why is it important at all? Like, right? So it might be very timely, but it's like if it's not important, what difference does it make? Uh, what qualifies you uniquely to weigh in? So I'm a lifelong skier, work for Powder Magazine. I'm a scientist. I'm a chemical biologist. All those things, but I would focus not just on the resume, but sort of like, what's your, what, what have you seen? What have you done in your research? What have you done in your life? Where do you live? Are you from that community? Um, and then I would just suggest consulting the guidelines for op-ed submission um, at your publication's uh, website. So almost every website, every news organization that takes op-ed submissions gives you the guidelines for submission. And just make sure you read those. And uh, make sure you see what else has been published by the publication on this topic so that you know that your op-ed isn't going to be a rehash of something they've just published because that can be pretty embarrassing. And then um, your university communications offices can be helpful if you want direct contacts at the news organizations. Okay, so that's all for this, this piece.